Welcome back. Summer is officially over. According to the Gregorian calendar, it ended on September 21st. But according to the presidential campaign calendar, it ended when presidential hopefuls stopped taking pictures at state fairs mid corn dog. For some candidates, now is the time to get serious and show their growing ups. For example, Mitt Romney released his list of foreign policy and national security advisors today. Tomorrow, he'll make what his campaign is billing as a major foreign policy address in South Carolina. This is what frontrunners do. They explain how they will govern. They tell us what they will do. But Mitt Romney, to his great dismay, isn't alone on the stage this week. A new pullout shows him tied for first place with Herman Cain. Herman Cain, who used to be known to most people as the guy from the pizza company, the guy who said what about Muslims in his, can in his cabinet? But now that guy, according to Nate Silver at the Must Read 538 blog, now that, now that guy is, depending on how you slice the numbers, either leading or tied for the lead in polls of Republican primary voters. Now look, one glance at the unemployment numbers is enough to get at the basic importance of this election. It is not for kicks. Obama is not a shoo in Whoever the Republicans nominate might well be sworn in as president in January 2013. And that means that they'll have their finger on the button. It means they'll have to take charge of the Treasury Department. And frankly, given the poor relations between Democrats and Republicans right now, given the gridlock, probably means they'll have responsibility for reforming the tax code, too. So in addition to evidence that they are tied at the moment, Mitt Romney and Herman Cain have something else important in common also. They have both released economic plans that would, among other things, reform the tax code. Mitt Romney's is very long. It is 160 pages, but good for him. The tax code and the rest of the economy is complicated. Herman Cain's plan for the economy is, I'm trying to think what the best way to put this is. It has a title. It, it definitely has a title. It's Herman Cain's 999 plan. And to listen to Cain tell it, it'll wash your car and do your dishes. But to read about it can be a bit of a mind-bending experience, actually. Kane's website says it is based on the principle that, quote, a dollar must always be a dollar, just, in, just as an hour is always 60 minutes. Okay, then. Also, quote, the natural state of our economy is prosperity. Freedom ensures that. So thumbs up for freedom. But what is the 999 plan? I mean, it's got to be more than just bottled freedom. Well, it's a 9% it's a flat tax on businesses, a 9% income tax, and a 9% national sales tax. That's really all we know. We don't have numbers on it. We don't have specifics. We don't have revenue estimates or information on who it will hurt and who it will help. It's sort of like going to a car dealership and getting a photograph of the car, except the car dealer is running for president. Fox's Chris Wallace seemed similarly confused a few weeks ago when he interviewed Kane. So he pressed him for some specifics. There's no explanation on your website of how you arrived at 999 or how these numbers add up. That is a good question, Chris Wallace. How do these numbers add up? Other than the rhetorical value of the title, 999, it's fun to say, though. How did Cain decide that 9% was exactly the right amount at which to tax people across all forms of taxation? How did he decide that was a perfect policy for freeing the economy? Here's how we arrived at it. I had some of the best economists in this country help me to develop this plan. That is intriguing. Who are the best economists in this country, Mr. Cain? Now, you say that, and you say that, as you, and you've just repeated, that this plan was researched and developed by some of the leading economic thinkers in the country. Yes. Again, we looked at your website. No mention of anyone. No, I haven't put them on there. Tell me the name of one of these leading economic thinkers who helped you come up with this plan. My, the chairman of my economic advisors is a gentleman by the name of Rich Lowry out of Cleveland, Tech, Cleveland, Ohio. He worked with a couple of other people, quite frankly, that are well known, that I'm not at liberty to mention their names. Why not? Why not indeed? If it were such a great plan, wouldn't they like their names attached to it? Would they like to be a part of history? Wouldn't they like to be famous for coming up with a plan that saved the American economy? You shouldn't be so humble, secret economic advisors. We want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. Because no one I talk to can really make heads or tails of the plan. Um, in fact, I'm getting two completely different interpretations when I went and looked around. The Center for American Progress checked out the plan, and they concluded it would raise about half as much as our current tax system. That's not the fiscally responsible revenue-neutral revenue plan Kane promised. In fact, that would create a deficit that I even... It's impossible almost to figure out how big that would be. So I asked the Nonpartisan Tax Policy Center to take another look. And though they weren't sure, they thought the corporate tax would actually act more like a consumption tax. And so all in all, the plan would impose an 18% tax on everything you consume. 
Now, let's be real clear. That's a huge move to move from an income tax system, which is progressive, to a consumption tax system, which is regressive because poor folks spend more of their money. It is a huge shift in the burden, perhaps the biggest, most radical seismic shift in taxes since we created the income tax. But I couldn't get the Kane campaign to tell me which interpretation was right. Earlier today, Kane told Lawrence O'Donnell that the other tax changes in his plan would more than compensate every low-income American. But that's not what the tax experts seem to think. You can't change it this radically and everybody comes out ahead. And so until Kane releases a detailed analysis of his plan, or at least a more detailed description so somebody else can do a detailed analysis, it's not something we can check. Ronald Reagan once said, quite wisely, but in another context entirely, trust but verify. In a primary, in politics generally, you don't want to trust that much at all. You just want to verify. So please, GOP voters, please go heavy on the verify. Verify, verify, verify. Joining us now to help us verify is Melissa Harris-Perry, an MSNBC contributor and a professor of political science at Tulane University. Melissa, it is wonderful to see you. Hi, Ezra. Glad to join you. So do you think, uh, do you think this is right? Would Herman Cain's plan sort of do the unspeakable, raise taxes on the things we buy and move taxes from the rich to the poor? Well, so first, deep breath, right? <laughs> um, I suspect that, that, that the Cain campaign is as surprised to be in a potentially front-running position uh, as, as the rest of us are. And so, remember, people run for president in all kinds of different ways and for different reasons. And, and part of, you know, sometimes people are really running for vice president or they're really running for a, a cabinet position. They're, they're running hoping that their primary bid will actually gain them status and credibility within the party. But in this particular circumstance, the Republicans have had such a hard time getting a candidate that is a clear consensus frontrunner that all of a sudden, Kane finds himself out there with a plan that, that is certainly half-baked. Now, that said, if he were elected president of the United States and he were elected somehow with a uh, Republican Congress that was prepared to pass any tax plan that he suggested and we somehow ended up with a 999 plan, all of, of which is pretty unlikely to happen... If that happened, this is undoubtedly incredibly regressive uh, and would create a circumstance where middle class, working class and poor households would carry an enormous, enormous tax burden. But and here's the thing about that, because obviously you're right in all in almost all of the particulars. We have a system in which it is very, very hard to make change. You can ask President Obama about that. There are many roadblocks. And of course, Kane is trying to get headlines. But I actually think it's sort of important. I think it's important yep. that when these candidates say this is what I want to do, we take that seriously because it is the only guide that we have to what they will do yep. in office. And also in particular in a in a crisis we had. And we'll talk about this a bit later in the show, a, an event in the Senate tonight where the rules got changed slightly. But but in a, in a fairly dramatic fashion. And so if Republicans decide to eliminate the filibuster, suddenly some of the things that we think are very unlikely now become in a, in a burst of uh, political energy with a, another recession and a new president, much more likely. So I, I do think, yeah. I, I sort of wonder whether or not Republicans would look at this and become a little bit unnerved because people do bring up things like the value added tax and sales taxes yeah. now, and they don't tend to like it. Well, so, so here's exactly, I, I mean, I think that, that you and I are on exactly the same page with this. So you started in your last segment, and we're really talking about the fact that this election very well may be decided by macro or even global economic right. processes. But that doesn't mean that what happens in the election itself is irrelevant, because what happens in these campaigns is we really start talking about what are the things that we value. When we elect a president, you know, we are not, in fact, electing someone who can just make policy um, however he or she would like, but we are typically sort of choosing a package of values and ideas. In this context, part of what choosing a Herman Cain for president would mean is choosing um, simplicity over a recognition of how complex something like the tax code is. So saying, look, I don't care really what 999 means. I just know that it's simple and I can understand it. It would also mean saying that we value um, sort of the, the wealthiest Americans keeping more of their money while burdening the poorest Americans 
really on the consumption end, right? So burdening them in the sense that every you know uh, loaf of bread that they buy, um, every you know pair of shoes that they buy is exceptionally more expensive relative to their income than it is for wealthier Americans. And really sort of opting into that as what our next set of economic and political values would be. And that I think I agree with you. That that is why it matters whether or not Herman Cain is actually going to be president is less relevant than whether or not we buy into those things as our value system. Beautifully put. Melissa Harris-Perry, MSNBC contributor and a professor of political science at Tulane University. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Nice to see you, Ezra. You don't hear it from the media nearly enough, but the left is officially, what's the word, perturbed. Author Naomi Klein joins me for the interview just ahead.